View from the Gutters, episode 84. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Marvel's Transformers, issues 1 through 18. And, to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 11804. Sweet. Uh, you guys ready? Yep. Let's do it. Uh, View from the Gutters, episode 84? That is correct! Yeah. You did it right! You should totally Sweet. put a cheering thing in I, the I will. post. Uh, I'm Andrew Chad. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Adam Panchin. I'm Brant gillahan Eddy. And I'm Ken Reynolds. All right. Yeah, we uh, no Joe this week, but uh, it's a triumphant return of Adam. Yay! Hello, listeners. Hello. Adam was on some ridiculous number of episodes ago. Uh, do you remember what book you were talking about? Cause it was Authority. Ah, yes. And now I'm back because uh, I read tonight's offering starting from issue one when I was a little bit short of six years old nice. all the way through issue 80. That wow. explains so much. Did you read the UK <laughs> tie-ins too? No. The reprint ones, not the uh, ones that were, you know, shit, what did I know of comic books then? I didn't even right. have a real comic book shop then. Yeah. Yes, the oh. Mafia bookstore in the Q Mart that I have referred to <laughs> from time to time. But yeah. Uh, yeah, they reprinted two issues of the UK Transformers as issues 33 and 34 of the American right. series. And the writer of the UK this was Simon Furman who would go on to continue to write Transformers so yes. I knew nothing about Transformers last week in the intervening week I've had a re-education yeah, I went yes. to one of those places there's where a, they like hold your hit, eyeballs you know, open with the things so, and you watch all the TV like uh um, Clock Clockwork Orange. Yeah, that happened to me last week, and I so, had like 40 different Wikipedia articles flashed in front of my face, and now I know things. That's awesome. So, learning. So Adam and I have obviously both read this series many, 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 many times and thought about it a great deal. Mm-hmm. Although uh, not recently until now. <laughs> been a number so, of years. But I'm, I'm really more interested in hearing what you guys all thought of it, since I don't think any of you have read this series before. Kate, nope. Yeah, Kate, you pitched it, but... This is your first time reading it. Do you want to go ahead and give us the the what's what on your read through? So, okay, when I had originally pitched it, I didn't think we would be going as far as we did. Yeah, and that's my bad. I totally misremembered how quickly things happen. And that's fine, uh, because I really didn't know going into it what number was a good one to talk yeah. about. Um, I, and, and there was definitely a moment when I was at issue, like, four, where I was like, Maybe I have made a mistake, <laughs> yeah. but as as it went on, I felt more comfortable with the number of issues. I read, well, yeah, because the, the first four had like exposition of everything because that was the four issue limited right. series. But then it started picking up when five those, by Bill Mantlo. Those are written by people who are like, "My God, we may never have another chance. Get it all on the page now." Yeah. Well, exactly. what's interesting is um, Jim Shooter has a blog or had a blog. He posted to it frequently for a couple of years a few years ago and then it has been mostly abandoned but he did a couple posts about the creation of the transformers comic book and property which was mostly talking about the behind the scenes corporate politicking which uh, all sorts of backbiting going on oh, but yeah. basically hasbro came to marvel and said we have these toys. Make characters out of them for us, because this is something Marvel had been doing for a few things, like with G.I. Joe. Uh, I think DC did the He-Man ones, too, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had a He-Man meets Superman in yeah. issue at some point. So this was common for comic book companies in, yes, the, in the era. Uh, um, and from the way Shooter's talking about it, uh, you know, it's like he did it. This isn't something you thought highly of, but it paid well at the yeah. time when the comics didn't pay well, and he considered it fairly easy, so he gave it to reliable people like Bill Mantlo and Bob Bedansky. Nice. And uh, if you notice, you know, the early – if you look closely at it, even after issue four, the early ones by Bedansky say script by, and it's right. only later on that it switches to writer because – you know, Shooter and other people were contributing then. And once we get around to talking about the substance, Shooter had a couple of interesting comments I'll talk about more. Well, and how how many years before the 
the animated series did. This was pretty much at the same time. And that was one of the things that Marvel was doing the initial, okay, this is this toy's name and this is their personality. And they, you know, wrote up like Cybertron, War, you know, factions. I think Autobots and Decepticons were uh, one of the things that Hasbro already had. And, uh, you know, then this got sent over to the animation people who took it and often went in a slightly different direction. Yeah, uh, Shooter talks a lot about all of the weird incestuous corporate politics where apparently like there was a Marvel Entertainment animation division that fucking hated the comic book division, like thought that they were all bullshit and was like trying to take all of the credit for everything themselves. Hmm. And there was all of this like huge amount of tension with pe- different people like stealing credit for things. It was oh, weird. very weird. But that sort of inside talk is what Shooter's Block is a lot of. And it's really cool. interesting if you care about comics history, if you might want to check out his blog. I'm sure you can Google it easily. He talks yeah, about we'll throw a, a lot of too. the 70s and early 80s stuff and how he became editor-in-chief and y- hauling Marvel out of the dark days of the 70s. Oh, yeah. So now we've got that out of the way. I had one more question. Oh, sure, sure. Because they came, it came from Japan first, uh, how much, like, wait, the Hasbro is a Japanese company. Like, the toy names in Japan yeah. are different than the ones yes, in the they, U.S. the shooter said like, in the blog that, and... they, they, that they basically threw out all the Japanese stuff and just mm. did it all from scratch for mm. the American But Japan. how much of the animated series, was it like uh, Power Rangers where they had to, like, rework no, around, no. like, the, previously there are, done There have stuff? been Japanese cartoon series later, but the 80s one was purely american ah, and cool. what's funny about the japanese stuff is that it actually has taken some influence not all but from uh, simon what's his name simon Furman, Furman. Furman. who has sort of become the godfather of yeah. the stuff and uh, when it gets back around to, you know after you guys have given your first impressions i'll talk some about that yeah because the the movie's based on Furman's like big run no right? no actually he he did his own version of uh, Unicron attacking Cybertron. Oh, so the after the movie, movie came out. first. Oh, oh yes. yeah, the movie was eighty six. Uh, which some of the issues we read were even yeah, after the, the, that. The animated okay. version moved quickly. Mm. You know, they had only like a couple of seasons, and then the movie, and then it was the time skip generation. Po- you know, post movie cartoon with Rodimus Prime and all oh, that, yeah. and it got really shitty. Yeah. Not that the first <laughs> two seasons were any great shakes no, to my begin God. with. They're um, awful. Unwatchable garbage is what I would call it. Fun them. fact, Casey Kasem refused to voice a character on one of those episodes because it was so horribly racist. Dude, all of amazing. it was just like... The cartoon had its ups and downs, but in a lot of ways, the cartoon is what's memorable. But we're, we're getting off topic. Yeah, yeah. Hey, your reactions. So I had never read this before. Um... And going into it, it was really dense, and I had a hard time remembering who some of them were, but it picked it picked back up uh, quite a bit. They helped you out by announcing their names and personalities like every and third power, page. And every, power set. Yeah. And talking about what their, it's, it's, that one character's weapon did, because all of their weapons were different. That yeah. fucking two one of pages. them had a <laughs> particle beam fusion cannon. To get through. <laughs> I read through. I read and reread those opening spreads so many times. I had them bloody well memorized when I was a <laughs> little kid. Because hey, it was the Transformers. I was reading at uh, the comic book store that I used to work at, Olympic Cards and Comics, and a uh, friend of the show, Sam Lucina, was working, and I was reading those panels out loud to him. <laughs> and then he's just like, please stop, please, like go away. You are being distracting. Uh, no, it's important that you know that you this need character. to know and that Starscream you... is going to add body counts of Autobots to the his leader's reputation. Yeah. That's important for children. <laughs> body count. Body count. Oh. It's amazing to me how like a, a lot of the like four kids stuff that we have today, like you know Batman Adventures and like the PG versions of what we read as kids that have kind of matured with us. Like Mm -hmm. all that stuff is kind of little kidified a little bit. Oh yeah. Reading this, like it's obviously for children, but it's fucking brutal. Okay. Think about it. Pretty violent. Yeah. Think about what happens in just the Transformers movie. Oh yeah. Like major characters die, but like at one point, 
Megatron is on Astro Train, and Starscream is basically like, I'm going to throw you out into space to just basically die of exposure, because I hate you. <laughs> Enjoy, kids. Oh, you're about to be eaten by cannibalistic piranha dinosaur robots. Enjoy, kids. Let's not forget Megatron literally beating Optimus Prime to death. Or incinerating Starscream into ash. Oh, it's oh, not like God, the comics yes. didn't have some bad stuff. I mean, oh, as yeah. a little kid, I freaked the hell out at issue five with Optimus Prime's severed head. Oh, yeah. oh. And the smelting pit left oh. scars that lasted years. That epi- those are the Cybertron ones, like yeah, 17 and 18? Seven, no, no. No, yes, it, yes like 16, 16 17? More like 13 yeah. or so. Whenever oh, they, they went, back it was forth. flashback to Cybertron. I remember reading yeah. that on the cover, and I was like, um, that's where I'm stopping. And I, <laughs> I love the covers on all of oh, these. Yeah. So, oh, so good. Often yeah. better than the comic inside. Well, uh, absolutely better than the comic inside, because they spent more money on the cover, probably. And I do love inside. that these, the, these trades... Uh, the, the new ones, at least, have each cover right before the issue and then oh, a little yeah. blurb oh, okay. about it. And be- yeah. so you like you flip the page and you're like, <gasps> cover and all its full color glory. Were you reading the new IDW classics or the ones with I like the so. blue, green, red, and yellow? But they were like different colored spines. No, these were like all black. Those, Those are the are- new printings. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, those are the ones I was reading. They've reprinted these a ton of times. And I, I thought it was I thought they were very well done. And the older reprints are actually missing certain issues because of copyright claims. Right. And, and none of them these, these black ones have all of the issues. They yeah. none of them have the UK stuff, but they did start doing collections of the UK classics finally. And those yeah. are a separate continuity. Uh sort of. Yeah, they kind of the the beginning of the UK continuity is actually rehashed US continuity with Simon uh, what's his last name Furman. 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 I don't know why I can't remember yeah. that. Like integrating like more backstory and stuff for individual yeah. characters, and then he basically takes it over in the UK and writes it for some tremendous amount of time, and then they bring him over here. And he starts to pull UK stuff into the US continuity, right? right. And you yeah. know, some of it just got left out, like and like Death said. Uh, if you've been reading Iron Man, the current run, the robot bounty hunter alien, the, oh, the yeah. Kyrian Gillian Iron Man run after he does his first four issue arc, Tony Stark goes off into space with uh recorder four, five, one and runs into this giant robot bounty hunter called death's head. And he's from Simon Furman's UK run. Does he transform into a moth? He no. does not. No. Unfortunately, no. No. he transforms mm. into a sickle. Did you have no, other reactions, kidding. Cade, to the once you got past the early? The, oh the yeah, sorry. I'm just really enjoying you guys, <laughs> you guys' discussion. Like I'm just like, ooh yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Um, so it it didn't occur to me exactly how much was in these because it's like in the first twenty issues is the first robot human romance that they go on in some later stuff in a lot more detail uh, and then have the robot robot romance stuff. And um, once they introduce some girl robots, hot yes. robot on robot action, he plugged oh, into robots. me. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, um. <laughs> I stopped reading, but I plan on finishing the entire series now because uh, yeah, this, I don't, me. I don't know if that was in you'll, the Marvel stuff or not, some... but You'll hit some low lights and some highlights. Some of the low lights include the car wash of doom and the uh, uh, that pro sounds rest- amazing <laughs> and the pro yes. wrestling micromasters. Yes. Okay, uh, all of that Those sounds were phenomenal. I remember when did the Constructicons show up? They were in the what we read. Did I just miss those? I yeah. I did stop at some point because I was they're, like they're I've had like, quite enough Transformers for today. <laughs> they're in like issue seven or something like. No, like, no, the Dinobots are in issue seven. The Constructor Constructicons don't okay, show up until later. later. It's Basically, later. It's like, in the teens. Like once they work out the whole creation matrix yeah. thing, yeah. like yeah. one side will create a bunch of new Transformers and yeah. the other side will create a bunch of new Transformers, yeah. and they just go back and forth in this right. weird. Arm and that has squares. nothing to do with the fact that marketing wanted to make sure that both sides had exactly. No, the same absolutely not. Plenty of new toys were always coming out. It's actually something that I really appreciated about this series is just how much continuity there is from issue to issue and you yeah. actually kind of get a sense of their like this war going on where like sure. we need to secure energy resources we don't have enough troops we're gonna go 
and take over this site. And like the Decepticons are holding humans hostage in this factory for like six issues. Straight. Yeah, I would never have been able to pick up an issue and read it without reading the stuff before it. Yeah. I think as kids, we had a higher tolerance for that, though, right? That's yeah. true, because we, like, well, looked... Comics readers in that time had a yeah. higher tolerance. Yeah. Well, they weren't comic book stores, so we weren't as concerned. It wasn't as readily available, so you just kind of had to deal with it. It was like, yeah. oh, you missed it. And oh, you well. had to figure... You had to kind of figure things out f- for yourself, like... But they had lots of cool editor's notes and stuff. Like, there's tons of editor's notes in these true. issues that yeah, are like, that see last thing. issue, see issue four, see issue eight, and you're so like, it really oh, helped, cool. especially early on when the coloring and the art was super inconsistent. Oh my god, telling all those fucking jet fighters apart is <laughs> well, yeah. goddamn well, impossible. They, they, they were so many art errors, uh, so many coloring errors, starfire. and especially in the early issues, I mean, they just looked like stiff toys standing yeah. around. They did not have people who had any idea how to draw them. Well, yeah. And there's also, there's like Starfire and like Jetfire. Jetfire, Jet- Starscream, um, Skywarp. Starfire, Skywarp. who was given life by the creation matrix, but later on references popular pastimes on Cybertron because sometimes they weren't as good about the continuity. Yeah. Yeah. Continuity editors, <laughs> man, they are like. Well, it was all, but it, you know, yeah. Brant, what were your main reactions? This is heretical garbage, and I cannot stand it. Uh, no, it's not quite that bad. Uh, well, so I grew up with the cartoons. I didn't read hmm. the comics. I wasn't into comics at the time. Were you time. disappointed by the lack of Energon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was expecting Energon every damn episode. Well, no, they shoehorned it in, but the, the, the cartoon did it first, and that's why they were bringing it in. Right. Yeah. And so that was my biggest problem is that, you know, we've talked before about, like, the density of older comics. Some of the art issues of older comics, although it's not the claim that new comics don't have art issues sometimes, but I think it's more of an issue on older stuff. So, yeah, not only was it kind of like thick to get through and hard to read, and you're like, what, like you were saying, like four pages has taken me 26 minutes. Yeah. And, and I can't even remember like who that character was when I started, you know, and for me, like my childhood was forged in the cartoons i still have a transformer shirt and my son keeps asking me who the characters are and i'm like ha, 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 jazz bumblebee grimlock <laughs> hot rod and optimus prime you learn those words well son and yeah the cartoon is garbage and i've gone back and watched it and i'm like oh my oh, god it's god. so bad although the movie is like just good enough to be like mm-hmm. yes this the is the movie amazing. is was much higher production of course values. and my father still tells the story of taking me to that film and regretting it for the rest of his life because all he had to deal with was me basically crying for days on end because Optimus Prime had been killed. I also remember that like the world was in danger. Like they, it was going to eat the world, no, it was right? Eat like, Cybertron. Earth uh, was right. falling. Right. But, no, I think yeah. but, like, it was, like a world was at stake. Yeah, and I remember like young, the anxiety like, of that right. was well, like the movie too much opens for a child. with Unicron eating a planet. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Unicron. I, I still um, remember being amazed by Unicron's transformation on the big screen. That was yeah. just my god. So, I, uh, I was blowing. way too young for that, but no, I, you know, and of course, I, I was known as broken up about Optimus Prime because I was a Decepticon fan. Yeah. I had the VHS tape, which tells I, you everything you need to know about Adam. Yeah, yeah. and you, it also your fun me childhood out. together. It also the movie also <laughs> bummed me out because Starscream was my favorite Decepticon. Yeah, which in retrospect, I'm not sure why, but uh, <laughs> because he was always he was like Megatron. There's the Energon. Let's get it. Like that was him all the time. He was the only one that had like speaking. Yeah. Lines. Bringing it back around to the comics. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have to agree with Brant. These comics, I mean, it's been a while, number of years since I read them last, and they're not holding up as well for me. Yeah. And this is why, you know, in the in the canons of Transformer fandom, the hardcore ones, the Simon Furman stuff is top notch, mm-hmm. and then sort of the movie, and then the best best bits of the cartoon, and then the earlier stuff. The, you know, the low points of the cartoon in the Badansky era comic are sort of at the bottom. Yeah. And I the- put my finger on a large part of it because of a, a random comment in the Shooter blog post mm. where he said that he w- felt the – he was not a fan of the what they did with the cartoon version because he thought it lost the human element. And if you look at what we read for this issue, there are humans effing everywhere. True. Even it's like in a just bad Godzilla one-off movie. issues, it's it's some random trucker, and you know they're giving more screen time to these a random lady kids in are duct camping. taped circuit breaker. You know, some crazy psycho supervillainous would be hero, and uh, 
so on. And this one chick falls in love with a robot. My favorite, favorite human moment, though, has to be O's dad, where he just shows up in, like, I think it's, like, the seventh or eighth issue in professional Optimus Prime cosplay. Oh, God, the, yeah. The, the Transformers have been on the planet for like eight hours, and O's dad was like, that motherfucker, I must dress like him. <laughs> and then he comes and scares his son. And this is like the most ridiculous <coughs> moment in the comics, but God, there's so much stuff. It doesn't age well, well there, but it, it makes me laugh. I, I will definitely agree that it doesn't age well. These are not by any stretch of the imagination good comic books, but there's just so much just creative energy going on there. All of this just like random wacky ass shit that I can't not love it. And there's some cool shit in here too. Yeah, and maybe some of that is nostalgia. Probably a good chunk of it is nostalgia. I mean, there's some stuff. I just kind of love the energy. Like when they go to Cybertron and they're doing all the crazy Cybertron stuff. Like this mega fortress in this province of the Cybertron thing and all the crazy things are happening. I I love it. But you're a big fan (laughs) of the weird stuff. That's yeah, true. That is true. And uh, it, what, what I'm trying to get at is the, these comics, especially these early ones, are very much focused from the human perspective. And oh, the yeah. Transformers are aliens. Right. It's more in the school of E.T. I mean, E.T. is small and cute and friendly, and these aliens are big and scary, but it's very much going on the, you know, going back to, uh, oh, wow. What is the old movie? When the the day the Earth stood still, mm, yeah, it's it's in that tradition. The Transformers are these aliens. They act in very alien ways. They keep saying, "Oh, you humans wouldn't understand. We're different." Right, and uh, it's very, it's a very different approach than the Furman era comics or the cartoon where the Transformers are. People. people yeah well and that's ultimately for me what's always such been a struggle about this about this property is that there's this tendency i think to always be like oh we need to add a human element we need to make them more like people we need to have human characters around and i've never you know not back in the cartoons not michael bay not anything in between i've never found a very particularly compelling integration of a human character into transformers a because when they're characterized like the cartoon like you're saying adam they are people i don't need other people because optimus prime has a personality he acts human like i don't the fact that he's a giant robot person doesn't affect me he is a very he is a hero and he's a very different hero than the strange alien war leader who's kind of nice but will say yes human because i violated my moral principles in a video game push the atari joystick button and blow me up yeah and so it's like (laughs) so yeah so it's just like really weird when it's like okay we got to have a movie but we got to have you know sam witwicky running around i'm like why it'd be like if in mickey mouse they're like well these are mice and they're not relatable. Yeah. So here's some people for Mickey Mouse to interact. And it's like, no, but I'm yeah, here it, for Mickey I, Mouse. I was right? talking to Adam about this earlier, and I I come at the same problem from a slightly different angle than him. And I think about it very similar to Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Is Godzilla this inscrutable alien like monster thing that's coming to destroy us all? And the movie is about the humans trying to fight back against this unstoppable beast. Mm-hmm. Or is Godzilla this heroic creature that is coming to fight the other monsters and save humanity and we have to support him and do what we can to help him fight off the bad monsters the difference being i think godzilla works better when it's the former well they they went they went back and forth man like you have the showa era and then they would go back to being like oh no now all this stuff ignores all of that fun stuff where godzilla's the hero if you want friend to the children you've got gamera right Right. i i think that the divide (laughs) turtle i think the divide in transformers is that A lot of people go like, these Transformers are not relatable. They're giant robots and they smash things. And the interesting story is the humans who are down on the ground having things smashed all around them. And they're wrong. And they're absolutely wrong. Because the real story is the war between these two ancient races vying for supremacy and trying not to stomp all over the poor indigenous peoples of this planet that they happen to be on. Yeah, which is more like, you know... More science fiction where the aliens just happen to be, you know, 
cool giant robots who evolved or, from naturally occur- occurring gears and pulleys or at least <laughs> <laughs> see the humans are there for the adults because the kids are going to remember every transformer's name based on their colors and shape just like when i was a kid on the michael bay film or not yeah. i could <laughs> like yeah. buttons. i could spell out every dinosaur's name and now yeah. i'm like uh, dino I think pterodactyl. Uh, I think there was something about the late '80s, early '90s, in which anytime you would have these otherworldly or mutant or whatever heroes, they always made sure to have a kid, kid hero, thirteen-year-old white boy, right? <laughs> kid hero <laughs> character to like relate April to. Well, right. So you've got like right. you know Casey Jones and April O'Neil for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You've got the Witwicky, what is his name? Well, it's Buddy. Uh, Spike and, uh, or, uh, it's either Spike or Buster. Yeah. Buster. And then you've got those kids from Dino Saucers. Like, it always, oh, yeah. it's always going to be yeah. oh, those some kids. Kids. There was the, there was the one point kids of view from Yeah, and it's for the kids. It's the same thing that Robin works for Batman, and, like, they can and put themselves in the position of Robin. And false because Rocket Raccoon is the most popular character in Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, every kid thinks they're a raccoon anyway. Um... Huh. Right? No. <laughs> Is that not true? I've not witnessed that yet, but oh, my son's young, so was... maybe I'll get yeah. there. One thing that I wanted to talk about briefly, how these comics obviously start out in the Marvel universe and oh, then yeah. kind of slowly drift away from that. Because within the first few issues, we have Dazzler, Spider-Man. we have Spider-Man, Savage we have Nick Land. Fury, we have the Savage Land. The Howling like, Commandos. They, there's an editor's note about, like, this happens before this issue of The Avengers. Uh, and also one about that for Spider-Man, too. Yeah. When Spider-Man shows up, they're like, this happens before 258. I'd relate more to the human characters in Transformers if they were all Marvel yeah. super Well, how much yeah. cooler would this comic have been if it had taken place in the Marvel Universe? Oh, uh, they also reference Godzilla because Godzilla was a Marvel comic at this correct. time. You know, on one hand, there's a part of me that's like, that would be amazing. And then the other part of me is like, no, because no. then you have these things where it's like, oh, my God, it's Galvatron. Thanos destroys it with the Infinity Gauntlet, eats the pieces of it and then says all right avengers where were we you know what i mean like yeah the scales no, i and get the you tone yeah. and the threat are just different but i it's the same thing for me I when did. like sandman shows up and is like martian manhunter i need my magic crystal and you're like wait what are you doing here <laughs> <laughs> all of you go away you get sep- get separated Mo- you co- john constant you go over there and swamp thing you're over here and yeah. Stay I'm, away from each other. I'm the Midnighter. I'm a parody of Batman. <laughs> and then oh, hi, later Batman. on, they get the G.I. Joe <laughs> oh, Transformers crossover. Yeah, yeah. And, many I, times. I do kind of feel like, though, the guy like dressing many. up and doing the whole, like, good guys versus bad guys thing, I, I did kind of feel, though, that, like, his part was more believable if you think of those people in the Marvel Universe, because they're, yeah. they're somewhat used to that kind of thing. Right, right. yeah. Yeah. They're much more well adjusted to the notion of strange shit showing up and then having to like psychologically. This is after deal. Secret Wars and yeah, all exactly. kinds of crazy shit. So, I mean, uh, if you look been a back skull, at like this period in Marvel comics and earlier, anytime there was a superhero battle, there would inevitably be the bystander who goes like, "Huh, they're filming a new science fiction movie. How interesting!" It's like really. Yeah, they all just yeah. on a lot of cocaine. <laughs> Another thought I had rereading <laughs> these with the adult 80s. me knowledge. They're obsessed with energy through these whole things in yeah. many forms, and there's that's a lot of '70s energy crisis showing through. Oh yeah, and you know that's context that six-year-old Adam just had no part of. Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. You always can see that's kind yeah, of yeah. The only years the Ford Mustang did not have a V8 in it. What well, was in the '80s, right? Or late '74, '75. Well, this was 10 years after that. But still, the I mean, you've got both well, the I, I meant crisis. the 70s energy yeah. crisis. Yeah, you've got the 70s energy crisis and, like, Cold War fallout stuff still yeah. happening in the 80s to where you see it in yeah, every 80s action Yeah, one of the characters is movie. saying, we don't know what these are. Are these a Soviet weapon? Yeah. I think that Take was it. actually the president being like, are they Russian weapons? You know, it's like their giant robots took over a coal mine and are holding... A factory hostage. Why are you not attacking them? Oh my so God. some sort of communist plot. And what the fuck is up with GB Blackrock weaponizing everything? The it's like this is an oil platform with artillery on it. Because uh, fuck dude, you, dude. It was the energy crisis. You have to protect your energon. <laughs> 
as I said, you know, GB Blackrock <laughs> is a knockoff Tony Stark. So it yeah. makes sense that everything's weaponized. God, I wish it had been Tony Stark. And yeah, then, how know. much better would this series have been if it and had how, been Tony Stark? Being like, oh, I'm going to steal all this Transformers technology. Yeah, yeah and how crazy is GB Blackrock? Is like, you know, giant robots fucking, you know, taking my shit and beating up my not exactly girlfriend. Who's and, now a superhero. And uh, A crazy then, superhero. And yeah. then this one comes up and spins me a tale about, oh no, Hulk, there's totally two sides. We're the good guys. We'll give you protection against those guys <laughs> bumping yeah. over your stuff if you help us out. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound and it's like, mafia. To, yeah, well, he's familiar I with totally the mafia. I totally believe you. My favorite was within like four lines of dialogue. Spider-Man's like, I get it. We're on the same side. And it's like, wait, well, what? <laughs> keep in mind that this is like the super, like the Marvel team up era spider-man oh, yeah. where he was teaming up with somebody every fucking week yeah. so it's like i'm spider-man obviously we're on the same side because this is spider-man team this up is, because i team up with everybody this is yeah. the what unspoken I do. rule of peter parker's life in the 80s which was that he was an incredibly naive dumbass yeah who are you okay i guess we're friends now weird <laughs> alien <laughs> costume i'll wear that johnny storm my bestest pal let's get in the spider mobile yes it was in fact that um, I do want to mention, though, that some of my favorite early episodes, going back to what we were saying before, early issues, were um, the issues where there was no human contact at all, where um, uh, Ratchet's down in the Savage Land looking for yeah. the Dinobots, and it's just like, it's Ratchet, and he's making a blood pact with Megatron, and then he's going to betray him, but he can't like outright betray him because no Autobots ever broken his promise. So he has to like hide the Dinobots in the snow, and then he's like, ha, you betrayed me. I knew you would do that. Now I'm double, double crossing you. <laughs> and that's, then he like tries to push him off a cliff. Like, that issue is one of my favorite And that's one of the things that I read. Art is really good. Yeah, it worked really well. Issue for six that. and seven, like whoever that artist is, I don't yeah. remember his name off the top of my head because they were constantly switching them out. But there was like just like a hot minute there where the art was fucking incredible. I and like, I wish that it was not so inconsistent. And you're yeah. not the only one those made an impression on because the very first story arc Simon Furman did when he came onto the American comic was. Uh, Focusing on Ratchet and bringing Megatron back from uh, getting tossed into the middle of nowhere with the space bridge. And that tells you about something about the comic that Megatron is gone from issues 24 to like 60 when Simon first yeah, comes Yeah, something on. like that. And he comes he's on only in like around for a few issues even then. So Megatron's just not there for most of the time and heck starscream's gone for a lot of it too well maybe it's because megatron's awful and uh, it's because he transforms into a gun and someone has to carry him megatron was my favorite (laughs) Uh, there's an issue where he transforms into a gun and then jumps into one of the jets and i was like wait (laughs) why would would you do that what i don't understand (laughs) i i always thought that shockwave was by far the superior decepticon leader well yeah yeah he's cool he turns into a space gun and flies Space gun. With and space he has an awesome voice. That's another of the things in the, the cartoon. Show. All the Decepticons could fly just because they were Decepticons. There was even an episode <laughs> about it. That's crazy. Well, most of them are planes, but the other ones that weren't were yeah, like they, inanimate they objects. Like well, yeah. Tape recorders well, and, and, and so, guns. Okay. So I was going to – this is something I, I hinted at earlier. So this is the other problem I had with reading this is that – so I actually jumped on board. I went kind of comics crazy when I got back into the industry, and that was mm. right around the time that Dreamwave had acquired – the rights to um, Transformers. So Pat Lee and his studio were doing like the hyper high fidelity computer colored. Oh yeah. Anime manga influence. This is like early 2000s. Early 2000s. Yeah, okay. And so of course, not only were they kind of going off on their own as far as story, it wasn't until IDW took it over that they brought Furman back, I believe. Mm-hmm. It was after they took over the license, just like last year or the year before they did Transformers issues 81 to a hundred actually bringing Simon Furman and the artist who was working with him at the end of the previous series to basically spend 20 issues wrapping up the entire Transformers storyline from these comics that was never finished. It's basically what they did with G.I. Joe, too. So they have their own IDW continuity, and then they also have... Like, wrapped up the Wrapped up the Marvel continuity. stuff. So the all they did all hail Megatron and like yeah. all this stuff. So, so not only is there that happening, but then I got, like, embroiled for some reason in, like, watching pieces of various Transformers cartoons over the years, and then at mm-hmm. some point like I actually more. screened a couple of the... 
a couple of episodes from the Japanese only series and then Ooh. like got really into looking up the continuity of all those things. And I think it, it got spurred because there was a, there's a female clone of Scar Starscream whose name is, uh, I can't remember. But I saw a picture of her in a Transformers card game that I was playing on my phone. I'm like, who the hell is this? And so then I like went down this crazy rabbit hole and it's like Transformers continuity is kind of like opening, you know, the grimoire of the dead and like having your eyes kind of scraped from the inside. You're like, it's crazy. It's I, I've only, I've only scraped the surface myself. But I'm, I'm way behind. On I've, it. I've, I've glimpsed, I've glimpsed the unseen and Cthulhu is coming for me, but it's so it's kind of one of those things where like to have that kind of experience over the last couple of years of being like, wow. Transformers continuity is really screwed up. And then to be thrown into these comics, looking the way they do with all that text, is just like, ah! But you, you know, learn so much. Like, Cybertron is actually a rogue planet that's the size of Saturn, of just course. flying around the galaxy. From Alpha Centauri. Yeah. Naturally and occurring And part of me just wistfully pulleys. wishes for the day where all I had to concern myself was with was... Why did Ultra Magnus not keep the Matrix of Leadership? Why were we foisted on Rodimus Prime? Because he wasn't. Why the was he foisted one. upon us? But I mean, and White Lion. Uh, <coughs> I, don't, I don't know who any of those guys are. You got the touch. The trans, the Transformers. White Lion property? is the name of the band that did. You got the touch. That you was always uh, billed as Stan Bush. Yeah, or no, White Lion did the other song. Maybe uh, they, they were not on the soundtrack, which I own. Yeah. It was, Got uh, me into Weird Al. There was NRG, which was just the letters NRG. Uh, there was Spectre General. Uh, there were a bunch of songs that were by Vince DiCola, who was the the actual like soundtrack composer. Uh, and I think there were like one or two other ones, but I don't remember White Lion being on the no. official album at the very least. But and of course Stan Bush. Here's some trivia for you. The the Transformers was sort of at a really low web as an American property for a long time. And the uh, mainframe cartoon Beast Wars oh, yeah. brought it back oh. in a big way that they were just, you know, touching the surface of the old continuity at the first a few nods. But that got such a reaction. They, you know, got deeper into it with Starscream's ghost and, you know, oh, actually right. it was the a Ark phenomenal so show. Yeah, and if you have never watched Beast Wars, not Beast Machines, never watch Beast Machines, but watch the three seasons of Beast Wars because it's on Netflix. Poor graphics Don't aside, yeah, your eyes that show are is believe. incredibly poor good. graphics. It starts aside. out weak; it yeah. gets better. The poor fir- graphics aside, hmm. the first half of the first season is a little weak. Gets better. Beast Machines, as my brother touches on. Um, thanks, Dan DiDio. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, after God. reboot, his studio would go on to work on Beast Machines. So I say work on, I mean destroy. Yeah, yeah no. Dan Dio <laughs> was one of the people who said, yeah, let's just throw out everything for Beast Machines. We don't have to worry about that continuity stuff. It just gets in the way. Uh, hey, guess what he did at DC three uh, years yeah. ago? Blinding, so, blinding rage flames on the side, side of my face. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't uh, speak quite as eloquently on Beast Wars or so warmly of it because the the animation for it is entirely too distracting for me. It's pretty But this awful. was a point of contention between myself and Tobiah related to Reboot as well. Yeah. I despise that show because it's like, ah, wow, look at that. That's horrible. That's and a, so the horribleness basically. Did you watch it at the time? Yeah. yeah. It, I didn't think it looked good then. I, don't, yeah. I certainly don't think <laughs> oh, it looks good okay. now. Well, okay. it didn't. And when compared to a lot of other stuff at the time, like it was not top of the line no, computer it looked weird. CGI. It was and just like, like, it was TV and, computer CGI. And I'm an elitist schmuck, and that stuff matters to me. But I was really young when those were on. That was the Transformers I watched was mm-hmm. Beast Wars. That was the, like my... the th- oh, so here's the thing that really frustrated me about Beast Wars, because again, I grew up with the original cartoon and then the second generation in the movie. So then they have it like be like, we're, we're you know, gorillas and dinosaurs and all this stuff. And it's like, but wait, when does this happen? It's like prehistoric, but is this Earth? And then it's like, well, kind of, but not really, because then Starscream's ghost comes. But if that Starscream's ghost from when they died, then that means this is no, the future, but it, this isn't. Earth. And it just was like, it, it makes obviously, sense you were not paying close yeah, enough attention. Because I thought it was horrible to watch. And that's fine. But if you actually watch it, they explain all of that. Yeah, and yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. It, was, it was great storytelling. I'm yeah. sorry that you're a Philistine. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, no, my, my whole. 
whole family got sucked in. We would like save our chore money to go buy the new Rhinox figure when it came out. They just did a reissue of Rhinox. Rat and trap. I almost bought it the other day. And, and I was like, I don't yeah. need this. We'll put <laughs> no, you back on you know, the shelf. For, for me, growing up with the original series, the, se- the second season finale of Beast Wars, where they go to the Ark and all the original Generation 1 Autobots and Decepticons are lying there. Oh. And yeah. then the Beast Wars Megatron says, I'm going to change time so the Decepticons don't lose and blows off Optimus Prime's head. And giant time vortex starts opening up. That sounds interesting. Maybe I'll read the synopses of the Yeah, episodes that, I was going to say, you should, because like each episode was very cool, but watching 20 minutes of it is like your eyes are bleeding by the end of it. And you're like, why is the pacing so slow? Oh, I get it, because they can't afford the animation <laughs> to make things move more Johnson, quickly. where's the 13th and 14th frame? I can't process that quickly sir. i will admit that dinobots run animation was god awful but that's I'll all you're gonna get out of me so the, the cheetah running when i <laughs> really when i was the reading this running. and the dinobots appeared i t- literally as a kid did not know that the dinobots were actually transformers i thought they were like an offshoot of gobots Oh no! Oh God, go the, don't don't the, talk about GoBots to the, me. Uh, <laughs> oh, go Grimlock I like was GoBots. the only Transformer I owned. I owned hundreds of GoBots, uh, whose names I cannot remember. Did you? They didn't see have names. Battle of the Rock? They, they were just they GoBots. Did. Yes, they did. They all had names. There was Leader One and Psykill and Scooter and that one that was uh, a I spaceship well, and that and other it, guy. It was, it was never as good. I even saw the the Rock Lords movie in the theater. I used to have yeah. the Rock Lords. I had the toys I, of the Rock Lords. I didn't watch the show. I never watched the show, GoBots. I just had them. I watched it occasionally. I bought them. I got really perplexed being like, is this, why is it this way? <laughs> let, let, me, let, let me put it this way to you. The Transformers theme song had lyrics. Oh. The GoBots theme song was just, the GoBots, the GoBots. Uh, White, the Lion, Go Bot. White Lion performed the Transformers theme in Transformers the movie. That is why I was thinking of White Lion. Okay. I will accept that. You can accept it or not, but it is in, it is fact. Where's Joe? It's fact. <laughs> it is it science is fact. fact. Yes. Is that a scientific fact? Well, yes. Uh, uh, sure. Or is that merely a theory? Well, no, no theory. <laughs> Historical fact. No that- bearing on science. Except the science of rock. Yeah. The science of awesome. <laughs> That's a so, thing. Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah. Kay, did you have anything else you wanted to add about this series? Um, Having pitched it, would you still <laughs> recommend it to people? Did it live up to your expectations? It, it did in that I enjoyed the storytelling. I did not enjoy the book. I enjoyed no. the story told in the book, though. Mm, the moral for me, looking back on it, is... Transformers is a very large, very sprawling, very multi-headed property. There are a number of decent parts of it you could explore, some of them in retrospect. This is probably, unless you're a really devoted fan, not the best nor the most influential. You could get away with reading summaries and skipping to the Simon Furman era if you want to catch the high points. Well, the other thing that I think is really interesting about this is because Brant was talking about kind of breaking into a continuity for the first time. You know, you see a thing, you know, like, oh, what's that from? It was similar to when I finally, like, started really researching Super Sentai, like what that was all about, (laughs) and watching Sentai episodes and being like, oh, my God, how did they make... And then they just cut out all this, and they (laughs) shipped it up, and, like, the production aspect of that. And I started to get really obsessed with the series and, like, going back and finding all this stuff. And, you know, we're longtime Marvel fans, so... Spider-Man is not confusing to us. We're like, yeah. And then, oh, yeah. And then at this point, he gets an alien costume. And, and then, then he wears it. And then it turns out it's alive. And it gets on a different guy. And then he's a di- And that's not weird to us. But he be- keeps wearing a black costume until it comes back and threatens his wife. Right. And it's like, that's not weird to us because we, you know, like, we're from, we're comfortable right. with that because we we're read it, right? Like, we, we know that, like, oh, at some point he was like a... He we, was, we he bought had the, into he, the concept. Yeah, he had the power cosmic, and then there were 14 different Spider-Man books, and then there was... Uh, and 14 the clone, different Spider-Men. Yeah, there was the clone saga. Um, and like, Point of order, Spider-Man never had the power cosmic. He had the Enigma Force. Uh, whatever. What? He was, <laughs> he was called Cosmic Spider-Man. No, that was uh, Captain Universe Spider-Man. 
Whatever. Captain there Universe is powered Spider-Man. by there Andy was Muffler a cosmic Force. Spider-Man. Come on, Charlie. There's a this cosmic is, Spider-Man. This is basic. We're stuff. We're looking it up. There's a cosmic Spider-Man. Um, I will hold there to m- this. There might be a what if Spider-Man hold. was Her- Gal- uh, Galactus. There was Herald. a what if Aunt, uh, May was the Herald of Galactus, which is the best what if. I agree. Um, but I thought she already was in canon. Yeah, she no. Um, <laughs> but you know, like we are familiar with this because it's something that we read from childhood. So someone who had started reading Transformers at the beginning read all of it saw all the shows all the stuff like it's not weird to them like it's not confusing in any way they're just like oh you start here and you read this and you do that and, and that's me yeah I, like adam was getting the comics when he was six that means i was three i couldn't mm-hmm. even read at that point i was just flipping through them looking at the pictures right and watching the cartoon and the movie and eating the breakfast cereal and collecting all the toys mm-hmm. and like it was just something that i was steeped in <clears throat> yes. When a lab accident granted Spider-Man the Unipower, his costume was cosmically changed into the Captain Universe outfit by the Unipower. This form gave him incredibly enhanced senses, strength, speed, flight, and limited kinesis. How was this costume commonly referred to in continuity? As Cosmic Spider-Man. Okay. Yeah. Point of order denied! But he, he might have been Cosmic Spider-Man, but he did not have the power oh, cosmic. Oh, okay. The only person who's... Ha- <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Toby. Fine. <laughs> Because clearly in Marvel, the only person who has cosmic powers is the one who wields the power cosmic, which would be incorrect. There's a difference between cosmic powers and the power cosmic. The but power the, cosmic is a very specific thing. It's not thing. the power cosmic Spider-Man TM. It's cosmic Spider-Man. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> all, you're, all you have to say is, I'm sorry, Chard and Brent, you were right. Never going to happen. It's uh, never going to happen. But we, I mean, but, but, we had all those books, you know, we had Web of Spider-Man and we had yeah, Web Superior of Spider-Man Span was the and, dark one. And you like had a, Legends you, of the Dark Knight. Exactly. You had or like all this stuff and people at the time like trying to break into that or people 10 years later going like, wait, what was all this shit that just happened? Oh, yeah. Like it's the same kind of stuff where like Beast Machines would reset everything and not care. And like that happens in Marvel Comics all the time. You have one year later and brand new day. And as a comic reader of Marvel Comics, like none of that is confusing, but that's what Everybody else has to face when they go well, come into a comic book store and go, I'd like to read Spider Man. And as a comic book employee, you go, Shit. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, do, where should I start you? What do you look like Which you can handle? Spider Man, do you want? Yeah, what How you like? much well, can I this... tell you before your head explodes? Well, or it's like Here's this... Ultimate Spider Man. Have a good day. Or it's, like... a weird, or it's a weird interview process. So if yeah. you were to read a, com- a Spider Man yeah. comic book, what kind of Spider Man comic do you think you would enjoy? Do you think you'd like to have you know have him be challenged by his mortal enemies? Do you think he'd rather have an interesting you know thing where he gets the you know the unit power and become how much Aunt May whatever. can you handle? Yeah, how much Aunt May can you handle? <laughs> How do you feel about Mephisto? How do you feel about not being married to Mary Jane Watson anymore? Because we could get you into all kinds of stuff if that's what you're into. How do you think about? How do you feel like all of Manhattan becoming spiders? Like, and that's that why the you? only Spider-Man I've actually enjoyed reading recently was uh, Superior Spider-Man uh, because yeah. it just you didn't have to worry about all that. that. Exactly. Yeah, I was like, it's. Dr. Octopus in well, Spider-Man's body. He doesn't know all that stuff. So he cared, I don't have to he worry cared about, about continuity as much as you did. Right. <laughs> <was> like, nah. <laughs> and that's what and that's another one is like I can you can hand someone that. And the thing is there if you go and you just search on Amazon Spider-Man Volume 1 for trade paperbacks. Good fucking luck. Like <laughs> there you're going to get hundreds. 15 of those well, at least. The the one thing that they're doing now that I think is helpful. Well, the two there's two things that I want to mention they're doing now. You know, we talked about reading these Transformers books. And that was in an age where there was no previously in, right. which at least they do that in most mm-hmm. Agreed. modern comics. At least Marvel does. Marvel I mean, absolutely does. I don't know if DC does or sometimes eh. does it or whatever. But yeah, it's like they don't know in. what previously happened, <laughs> yeah. so they cannot write a <laughs> they're, previously they're about in. it themselves. They, they no <laughs> care, one of those. but they do for the crossover issues where it's like. The end of Superman number 31 oh, goes sure. into the next one, and they're like, previously in Superman 31. Well, yeah. that's mostly because when they go to do a crossover like, oh, I don't know, World's Finest and Superman Batman, they'd go, ah, shit, World, uh, Superman Batman hasn't come out yet, and that was part three. Do you think we should put part four out before we put part three out? Yeah, fuck it. Just put it out. Or at least they want to point you to what other book they happened. want you to buy. That More happened. That happened. And then they put the next issue of World's Finest out. So you have two issues of World's Finest. And you go, yeah, I still haven't read part three of that crossover that was three it's issues ago. Funny, because apparently Marvel may accidentally do something like that 
currently because apparently the Death of Wolverine got delayed in a weird way. And so there may actually be books that are part of Death of Wolverine that will release before the actual other parts of Death and of that, Wolverine. And that happens so often at both companies. An- it's another atrocious. Uh, mark in favor of waiting for the trade. Absolutely. Yeah. That's well, all I got to say. And that's what I was going to say. is the other thing, at least, that Marvel has had a stronger time doing, although DC has done it too, and I think this is just a modern comic affectation, because you even see it in the image books, is, you know, we, we talked about it with, like, the Fuse, calling the first issue, the first set, you know, the Russia shift. Right. Like, kind of subtitling series yeah. to signify that there is an ongoing story, but that also creates an opportunity when it's collected to say, oh, here is a specific story of this character that I think you should watch. And I think that's that's kind of a natural, it's funny, I'm in the middle of watching Next Generation, but rather than go back and watch all seven seasons of it, I'm like, I want to pick individual stories that I know I kind of enjoyed or don't remember very well, and I want to see if they're okay. And so I think that comics have become that in a lot of ways for people who are not in continuity. Oh, absolutely. Is that either you get either – and then we definitely talked about this when we were talking about um, Avengers Forever. Either you read a book like that and you're like, oh, my God, I'm so interested. I want to read more. Or you're like, I kind of like that. Let me rely on someone who is interested about all that bullshit to tell yeah. me if there's another good story that I could read. Uh, You'd be like, right. oh, yeah, read Brubaker's – or um, Bendis's run on New right. Avengers – with Kang when Another back. good example of this would be Tower of Babel. Like you can read that story without reading the actually fourteen Morrison, volumes. The Morrison and Beyond late nineties, early twenties, two thousands JLA run was really good for that. Yeah, because yeah. they they tended to bring in um, creative teams. I mean, there were some that stayed for a long time. Uh, like Obsidian Age is one of my favorites, but it's two it's two volumes. It's Doug Mankey and uh, Joe Kelly wrote. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it encapsulates like six months worth of issues, but that's it. Like you could have read those issues it before, be you year. could have read the issues after, and it doesn't really matter. Right. But it's it's like okay, here's the here's the general premise, JLA. Meh. Here's a good story, and I'm yeah. I think that that's and I, you just look for those trade volumes. You don't need the whole run. And isn't that kind of ironic though that that in some ways episodic storytelling is actually what we kind of pine for when everybody else is moving to. Well, well it's, it's, not, it's not so much episodic form. as contained. more contained. And the sure. example I'm going to go with is James Bond. You can watch any James Bond movie and just be dropped in the story. And he's got experiences that are being referenced back to, but you don't necessarily need to understand all of the details in order to appreciate the film. I would because, agree, except for Quantum of Solace. Sure. Because but what, what the, really matters is the format right. and how the how the story is delivered and how it can be uh, caught up on after the fact. Right. And if they were like, okay, here's this 12 issue chunk of Avengers that tells a complete Avengers story. And it's kind of self-contained within that thing. Like it would still give them the ability to tell longer form stories and have characters develop over time, but be kind of segmented enough that you could say like, here's a really good section of Avengers where they tell this really good story. Or this JLA section, like, the Obsidian Age is a really Actually, great story. You just kind of need to know like these two little things. That'll put most of the stuff in context for you. And DC, you can kind of go from there. DC did that so much better than Marvel. It was something that they used to do, you yeah, know, because you didn't do you didn't have Batman Volume Six Hush. You just had Batman Hush. You just Which had is absolutely the way they should do Bruce it. Wayne Murder Nightfall. And if you know a lot about Batman continuity, you know what order those go in. Sure. Is that necessarily the most important thing in the world? Not really. Nope. Yeah, and I wish that they would, like, with Mark Wade, they just restarted Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Same story, same creative team, new numbering. How do you tell you tell the difference? You fucking can't. Right. And I'm very much in favor of them. They should have gone like, okay, this was Daredevil, the man without fear. Now we're starting a new story arc, same creative team, new numbering, but this is Daredevil, a different subtitle. Right. Or, or, you know, just a, a subtitle for the story, like, uh, what was the, Born Again, or yeah, right. uh, Guardian Devil, or whatever. Or Shadowland. You know? Exactly. Well, and I think that's the, you know, going all the way back to, I think, even before we started actually recording, it's, I think that there's that tension between um, trying to appeal to the collector's market by doing renumbering issues, and then trying to, like, have things still be quasi within the old numbering, and, like... All this weird stuff, but I'm I'm with you, and we've talked about this at length about like, and they and Marvel is doing it with other series, right? Like Hawkeye, Black Widow, like there's tons of their B tier or satellite titles where they seem to have gotten the point uh, that it, 
Iron Fist, the living weapon. Yeah. Like, it's not called Iron Fist, uh, what was the last one called? The The Immortal Immortal Weapon. The Immortal Immortal Iron Iron Fist Fist and Iron Fist, the living weapon are two different series. Yeah. Right. And you can tell. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, why not commit to just keeping a book alive for the arcs? And and they were kind of doing that for a while where they, like, you know, we had Uncanny X-Men for a long time and then they were like, we're going to do Uncanny X-Force now, and now we're going to do Uncanny Avengers. And they were, like, moving those adjectives around through the different characters. Or Incredible Hulk, Unstoppable Hulk, Indestructible Hulk. Savage Savage Hulk, Hulk. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, you know, they've been doing it a little bit still. The Superior Spider-Man, they're going to be doing the Superior Iron Man. Like, they tell you a little bit about kind of what the series is going to be like based on the adjective that they give you as part of the title. And I thought that that was a really cool system. It doesn't necessarily tell you about the order that they're going in, but it at least differentiates them somewhat, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. If if somebody is like, okay, I liked The Incredible Hulk, you know, the, the animated series, The mm-hmm. Incredible Hulk, they're going to buy the comic The Incredible Hulk. Yeah, it, it's uh, something I was talking about on one of the Out of the Fridge Batman episodes this month. I don't know which one or when it came out or when it's coming out, so I can't tell you that, but... Um, I was talking about like the unintended side effects of Batman Beyond being the only name in town, right? So like you watch Batman Beyond the comic book, uh, you watch the show Batman Beyond and you go into your local comic book store or like a grocery store where you don't have someone to guide you through that. And you're like, I want a Batman Beyond comic and you pick it up and it was exactly like the animated series. Why? Because there was no Batman Beyond comic. But when you go, I watched Batman, the animated series what Batman comic do I buy? And there's like five different Batman comics. You don't know to buy Batman adventures, Batman adventures. You don't know that because no one told you that, but Batman beyond like the cool side effect of that was the show and the comic that were identical to each other shared the same name. And that was really easy for people, for kids to go from one to the other without really needing a guiding hand to point them the right way. Yeah. So I think it was cool. And to bring it back around to Transformers for just a moment, mm-hmm. uh, I think that Marvel was successful in that regard that, you know, you had the Transformers toys, you had the Transformers cartoon, you had the Transformers comic, and there were sort of transparency between those things, even though the continuity between the cartoon and the comic was different. Right. I, as a child of the time who was consuming both, didn't feel weirdly confused because this happened in one thing and not in the other. Like, I was right. kind of able to jump from one to another. I had a similar experience with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, too. And oh, yeah. as much as I can see the flaws in this comic now, and it is by no stretch of the imagination a great comic, especially not in this early part, mm-hmm. even reading it today, I feel felt like every issue that went by, it was getting a little bit better, a little yeah. bit stronger, a bit more coherent. The art was improving. They were building the continuity like it was turning into something. And having read it so many times, I can tell you, any listeners out there who are interested, it continues to build and get better. And I feel like there is a dynamic energy there, that there's something inherently interesting about the setting and these characters Mm -hmm. that is compelling and that I want to learn more about. And not just because they're giant robots punching each other, which is cool just on the face of it, but the... The story that they build has something there that I really like even today. Also because they are robots and not flesh people and it was the 80s, they could get away with a lot more violence. Oh, absolutely. Oh my God, so many Transformers die in this series. And lasers are constantly shooting stuff. Yeah. Well, they explain, like, we don't die like humans die. We're just deactivated and maybe we'll be rebuilt one day. Yeah, and I I think that uh, something we mentioned earlier, you know, like, is it just nostalgia? Like, uh, am I enjoying this just from nostalgia? As someone who's never read these before, never saw the cartoon, really. Like, I watched it when Sam bought the DVDs of Volume 1. I was <laughs> like, this is garbage. You like this? Why? So bad. Like, uh, I, I think there really genuinely are cool moments in these comics. I think awesome stuff happens, and it was enough to, for me to go like, dude, that guy's awesome. Like, I have a favorite Transformer now. I didn't a week ago. Huh. Like, I didn't. I was like... Who's your favorite Transformer? Ratchet. Hands nice. down. Dude's dope. 
He's also just like such a cool character trope because he's like, I'm not a warrior, I'm a doctor. Like, I'm here to help people. And Optimus Prime has that great line where he's like, you learned to be a doctor on Cybertron. Now it's time for you to learn to be a warrior on Earth. And Optimus it's like, Prime ah! had the best line. As a head, as a severed head, he was yeah. cooler than all of the Decepticons. Well, that's why Optimus Prime has always been my favorite Transformer. He's red. To the extent that I cosplayed as Optimus Prime when I was five. Was it as good as O's dad? Uh... I'm going to say yes, but okay. only because my mom made the costume and she's listening. <laughs> Once again, thank you, mom. I'm and sure I'm going to post awesome. that picture oh, when we post the do. episode because this was a fucking dope trend, like Optimus Prime costume for a five year old. That's awesome. This is in the era when they didn't make costumes for kids no, like they it, do now. It was made from like cardboard tubes. I had a transform or a Power Rangers hey, costume that my mom you know, made. Our mom was doing cosplay decades before cosplay was a thing. She oh was, yeah, this was she was not new to this. Yeah, yeah, I've mentioned before, our mom is OG, original geek. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You, I, I have a, a picture of her cosplaying as a bottle of typewriter correction fluid from a convention in the 60s. Explains so much. You have no idea. I, they they I didn't don't. have cool things to cosplay as back then. She did her best. I'm sure they did. It was the 60s. <laughs> they had lots of cool things to cosplay. Like, all of Marvel and DC had been created. Yeah, hey, it wasn't the same. Did I mean, tell them about yes, I told them about the letter in Avengers. Yes, number yes, seven. yes. What is you, so? Yours is Optimus Prime, Toby. Megatron. Yes. Yours is Megatron. What about you, Kate? Do you have a favorite favorite Transformer? I don't know. Yeah, there there are a few of them I really like. Um, it's Wheeljack, isn't it? It's Jazz from the movie when he's like, "What's cracking, little bitches?" I actually well, that really was an actual. Who was it? Was it Scatman Crothers who was yes. doing that voice? Yes. So that's legitimate. I loved that line. I still say that. Not ironically. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't think that irony is a real thing. I don't think you can ironically like something. I think you either like it or you don't like it. So, Brant, what was your favorite Transformer? Uh, Jazz, actually, is my favorite Transformer. Good deal. Jazz, Jazz had some really Although, cool I do have a special place in my heart for Cup of all Transformers. I Frank can see Cup. that. I don't know which one that is. He's the old one from the movie. The one who's with Rodimus all the time. He's like, back when I was on this planet, uh, all this okay. crap happened. And like Rodimus is like, okay, Cup. Actually, Thanks. one of my favorite lines for the movie is when Rodimus, or Hot Rod is like, so Cup, are you going to tell us what this reminds you of when Unicron is destroying the planet? Yeah. He's like, nope, never seen anything like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that uh, Prowl is the Fair Lady Z, though. The dots in Fair Lady Z. Um, that's what car he's modeled after. No. Because I love Project X Challengers. The Fair Lady Dotson Z manga. Of course you do. Look it up. <laughs> so Business it's, manga. It's a nice car. And actually, three Transformers turn into it. Really? Yeah. There, I was reading about the, some of the different toy lines. There were three that turned into that because th- they they were the same figure, just repainted with different names. Yeah, the Jets were like that, too. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Like Sun. Uh, sun, it, it was uh, Starscream, Skywarp, and Thundercracker were the original three, and Thrust, Dirge, and Ramjet were the second trio. But then I still was, remember all that. There was a there was a orange and yellow plane, and he was we. Ju- I just saw the Master Figure collection. Yeah, well, there's the entire plane. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing is so you had the yeah you had the original six, and then there were two more. And then there was... And then the aerial bots got brought Jetfire in. Jetfire slash Skyfire, who was in the comics, who, oh my god, the licensing and continuity issues around him, because he was based off a Macross Veritech toy. Mm. Mm-hmm. And by based off of, you mean ripped off of. Yeah, so I basically... So it's like a mold was. copy. Yeah. No yeah. So he the, was, so he the, was a Macross Veritech, and the issues around those... Oh, God. Yeah, actually, the, the trade explained that a little yeah. when they introduced him because it said that uh, they were allowed to make the toy in America, but they were not allowed to use the same model for the comic, so they look completely different. That's cool. I was going to mention that I was reading the 30th anniversary trade today, which has selected issues from the first Marvel run of Transformers. Mm-hmm. It has, like... Issue 1, Issue 17, which was the Return to Cybertron. It has 
some random issues that introduce specific characters. Then it has like the first Simon uh, Furman issue, and it's just got a bunch of random stuff. But what was cool about it was there was this like there was like an intro to each issue that was talking about like why it was cool, how this person got the job. Like a lot of what I know now about Transformers is from that trade that I read today. And uh, it's a cool hardcover. And if you like, IDW's been doing some cool collections. So yeah, they do if some you're really interested in what Transformers is like, but you don't want to read the Marvel stuff, like maybe just that trade. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, it gives you a good little insight. Probably. Well, and if you love it, then you can go get the Marvel, the IDW classics. Yeah. Awesome. Groovy. Yeah. So check those out. So it was, uh, your favorite was Jazz? Then? No. no, my favorite's Jazz. Flash yeah, card. I was saying, okay, so Jazz is one I liked. I really liked Bumblebee in that it would say putt-putt when he was driving <laughs> instead of room. He becomes a gold bug? Yeah, because like, because uh, the one scene with Wheeljack that I loved was like, Wheeljack was like, yeah, I'll follow him. And Wheeljack goes, vroom, right past him. And he's just like, putt, 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 putt. I, um, I was reading it today and I turned to Sam and I was like, why is Bumblebee a VW bug? Why is he not a Camaro? <laughs> Somebody's Just not a big. They're different. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, obviously in the movie they couldn't have done that. It would have well, been, they probably could have. It's just that weird. The General Motors paid a lot of money to make them all into there. Yeah, I just it would have uh, or Ford. I, General Motors. It would have been weird for the way they wrote the movie. Well, yeah, because he would have been like, "I want that sweet car." And it, like, pans over, and it's just... no, no, that would have been perfect. Like yeah. he can't talk, and he's got like a weird sense of style. Yeah, like that's the thing that actually is kind of like that's the one thing that actually uh, what do you call that? Uh, it takes you out of the realistic mm-hmm. versimil- immersion breaking. Yeah, there's a name for it though. Is it verisimilitude or? Well, verisimilitude is like the idea of reality. Yeah, but anyway, what what broke what breaks the logic of the Transformers movies for me probably more than anything else is it's like we are you know we are these beings from beyond the stars and we decided to pick things that inspired us and all we could pick from was North American subcultures and one cars one company's worth of cars. I mean, look at that amazing British roadster. I don't want to be one of those. I want to be a truck. It's like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, I also liked that in the comic, the arc accidentally makes the Decepticons into planes mm-hmm. also. Because it's just like, all of these are robots. I'll fix them all. Like, it, right. it's kind of a dumb shit. I also did like that one note in the first issue where they're like, our scanners detect no life whatsoever on uh, this planet. It's yeah. like, it's four million years ago. There were tons of life back then. Well, there were no cars though right that's, that's all the thing they, like, they just they don't recognize living things or car- or carbon, carbon as based. living things yeah for like the first meat bags. couple of issues <laughs> until they're like oh wait these these little things that are inside <laughs> the cars are actually alive how yeah. weird is that i the the one thing i'll say about the like who became what like form thing is that i wish they would have kind of committed to it all the way i realized why they didn't because like match sets are amazing and stuff but i kind of liked that for the long for at least the beginning like and this is especially true in the show and i feel like they did this for the most part in the comic at least for as much as i've been exposed to it. it's like the autobots were cars mm-hmm. and a couple of other weird special vehicles you know the jeep the hovercraft i can't remember that guy's name oh i had that guy uh though and, he was a little tiny one you know right? megatron's a yeah, gun what's yeah. his name is a or a, um uh Oh, I totally forgot about um. What's his Jack name? Wave. Oh the, yeah, the boombox. Yeah, it became a boombox. Sound well, wave. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was Whatever. sound wave, but then there was blaster. Like they, like they, those, some of those match sets were fun. Uh, what's his name became a, a microscope. Um, oh, perceptor. 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 But I Who like was that kind of a badass in this comic. Yeah, like, he was the leader. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty cool in this. But I like that you know, like in essence, the Decepticons were like weapons of war, and the uh, Autobots were like forms of like. Civilian vehicle. Yes, yeah, so civilian. Utilitarian. Thing. Yeah, you, utilitarian. Well, you had, yeah, you have the fire truck, you have the police car, you have the ambulance. Yeah. You know. You've, got, hot you've got helpful things. Right. But then they start, like, doing weird stuff, like, Astro Train is a train and a space shuttle, and then, like, it's like a train. Well, train should be, like, an Autobot. And then, like, the Autobots get the, uh, what's his name, who's the, like, Apache helicopter, and, like. Yeah, they broke it down. You know, later. so, like, then it starts to kind of erode, and you're like, oh. Well, and they get dinosaurs. Well, yeah. Which is but the awesome. Dinobots were their own thing, and then yeah. they kind of joined. Oh, and up. then there were the Predacons, who were like all animals. Well, and then the and the uh, Insecticons as well. That's true. Well, Ooh. insects are kind of. I mean, they're generally classed as evil. Yeah, I, I pretty much would. 
No yeah. spiders, though. Well, spiders aren't insects. In well, no, Wars, I know, but... In Beast well, Wars, yes, there was a spider. And Scorpion, too. Arachnid. Scorpion. Arachnid. Scor- <laughs> God, who was also the Decepticon leader for a long time in the series and was a super badass. Yeah. It basically had the same Brought star screen voice. So yeah. it was like, Megatron! <laughs> What's wrong with I'll get you, Optimus. Gorilla. Optimus Primal. Primal. You had a surfboard. It was cool. So yeah. surfboard built into his feet. Yeah. It so, was one of the best toys ever. The Transmetal. Are we, are we ready to move on to recommendations? Yeah, we probably should. We could yeah. talk about Transformers forever. Oh, did want to mention really quickly, though. I, when they did the movie reboot and all of the Transformers look like buttholes, I'm like I didn't care because I didn't know like what was cool about Transformers. Uh, I was like, I don't get it. I don't understand why everyone hates Michael Bay. This movie's like kind of charming. It's not great, but it's like a fun kids movie. Like kids will go and they'll be like, it's a car that transforms into a robot. That's cool. Is the same experience that I had with the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie where it's like, for all intents and purposes, like it's a good kids movie. It's funny. Like it's <laughs> charming. But the turtles look like buttholes. Like, why does this guy have the worst aesthetic taste of anyone on the planet? He seems to be a. He seems to believe in the philosophy of busy. Like oh, Shredder is the disgusting. worst example of that in that movie. It's He's like, trying to bring back Rococo. Starscream yeah. is like an upside down triangle of poop. Like <laughs> well, in the that, movie, it looks awful. Well, and I, I mean, like, and I, I and it's amazing it. how recognizable all of the Transformers are individually. Yeah, when they look like poop. Yeah. Well, and their faces, well, like their predator, metal well, I mean, predator uh, mouths. and God. Like in the comic book. Oh, yeah. Honestly, no, I agree with of them you. have the same design, but within the comic book, like just looking at their silhouettes, there's a lot of differentiation on it's a big robot. And I do I, get confused with the jets and like some yes. of the cars yeah. and stuff. Oh, yeah, because well, they are literally the same model. And their heads are different. Yeah, and I cannot are, remember And the that. art is not but that's necessarily why, consistent. That's why the show yeah. was kind of superior in that regard because they all had different voices. So even yeah. if you were like... The, well, the colors are a lot stronger in the show because they're consistent and whatever. Mm-hmm. But also, then the voices kind of like help kind of get you home. You're yeah. like, oh, well, that's mm-hmm. clearly Starscream. That's clearly Rainbow. I got <laughs> <laughs> um, I was also disappointed when they went from the square robot voice box letter uh there, that was another inconsistency. It goes back to the square one later. It yeah, stays that way. Because then it uh, went to the round ones with the like jaggedy line t- balloon yeah. tail. Which yeah. Is, I didn't like that. I like the square ones. Those were square cool. ones are definitely better. It made it sound robotic in my head more. So it's different. I was going to say something oh, just about Michael Bay Transformers real quick, which is that there are a lot of things that have nothing to do with Transformers that I like about certain Michael Bay movies and really don't like about others. But I think, like, the problem with Transformers is you could not have made realistic versions of what they used to look like and have that look right. Because, like, if they were, because think about how simple they're shaped. Yeah. And you're like, really? A truck breaks down into four simple parts? Like, I think it would have looked sweet. I think it would have looked really strange. I think you say that, but if somebody had actually put a video, like, an VG sure, character of it. I'm sure online there's someone with, like, high res 3D but I bet, mock-ups I bet they're of, busier. Like, I bet they're busier than the cartoon. Oh, well, was. the cartoon oh, yes. is, like, well, painfully they, simplistic right they actually created There's like no anniversary editions of a number of the tr- core transformers that's the that, masterpiece series yeah the masterpieces yeah. you actually transform into what they looked like in the cartoon and a like very realistic version of the thing that they turned into and they're very posable they have like lots of articulation so yeah. they're i mean they're like 80 to 100 dollars. right but the yes, fact that you but, can do that in a toy yeah. means that you could definitely do that with right. a 3d with, rendering with yeah, textures yeah. and no, color I, I, that's and what i'm lighting. saying is that you can kind you of hew between it. both like i yeah. think michael bay has a naturalist thing that's way too busy it's like to the point where it's like if i can't tell exactly what it is then why do i care and i think that's my this problem looks like a bunch of like one of those uh, magnetic sculptures yeah you know, yeah the, the thing where it's like there's a big magnet and you've got pieces and you stick them together and the yes holds them up one of those like desk like uh, yeah. executive of desk toys where you just like mash all the magnet pieces together and they're like look it's a transformer uh exactly. yeah they looked terrible I and i didn't a question. get it um the new marky mark movie is uh, that a michael bay movie Age yes. Of Extinction? yeah yes and where does it fit in with the other ones it's, it's after, after. The f- it's, it's, it's in order it's a okay. it's a sequel slash restart number, number four it is now technically number four okay do and you I need to watch the other ones first no not a reboot but a relaunch not really okay. i mean they basically it's from what i understand i haven't watched it all the way through they basically explicitly are like here's why we don't like the transformers because like they blew up half of chicago and hong kong and new york and a bunch of other things here's why here's why some certain people don't like them here's certain people that do like them all the people that you really kind of cared about from the first films are gone. Here's some new people to care about instead. Okay. 
and what and it's two and a half hours long. And what's damning to me are the two are two pieces of in, or three pieces of information. Somebody did it's a supercut of all of the robot battles from all four of the Michael Bay films, and out of seven hours, two and a half, five, eight, almost ten hours of film, all robot on robot robot violence, which would be my only justification for seeing those films, equates to something roughly around twenty five minutes. That's a lot of time staring at Shia LaBeouf, Megan Fox, Marky Mark, everybody else running around being like, oh, there's robots and they're doing stuff to like justify that much film being displayed. It's a, it's a long ass movie, the new one. And I've heard or that Dino Blast don't even Shia show LaBeouf up until the very end. hilariously chased by a transformer that transforms into a sexy girl. Swinging on monkey vines? Wait, what? Oh, I'm sorry. We're talking about a different movie. I apologize. Um, but the other thing about it is, uh, crap, I lost my point. Because, see, I'd be more likely to watch the Marky Mark stuff. Oh, sure. As long as I didn't have to go see the Megan Fox stuff. No, you don't. Well, she doesn't even do about. anything. Those movies aren't Megan Fox movies. They're sh- they're the beef. It's all about the beef in those movies. Okay. Yeah. Okay, oh, well, oh thank the you. third thing. The third thing that's <laughs> pretty damning about Age of Extinction is that most v- reviewers who, especially the large population of them who are more artistically minded and were like the original ones were garbage, basically their 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 praise of the fourth one was, it's not as bad as the last two, ergo, it must be okay. <laughs> Which is like, that's not, that's not a good reason to create churning out multi-million dollar movies with this franchise. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, that happens. All and right. Then I want to meet so... all the people like Sam Lucina who are out there to see those movies live over and over again. I I don't know how many films he pays to see. Well, the the, the first couple of Transformers movies, he paid real cash money to okay. see those films over. I went to go see the very first Transformers <laughs> I judge you, Michael Sam. Bay movie, yeah. Midnight Showing. It was the last Midnight Showing I ever went to. After that, they were Midnight Showings were dead to me. Never again. Spider-Man 3 killed my Midnight oh. Showings. <sighs> my, I, Until uh, Thor. Thor reinvigorated my love for the Midnight Show. For me, it was Attack of the Clones. <laughs> oh, God. I so, saw that movie twice in theaters, and the whole second time, I was like, why, why am I in here? Because I could be outside right now. There's a well-established and commented phenomenon. You thought the first time you saw it, you missed something. Yeah. So you went back to make sure well, that you didn't miss something that actually would have made that okay. It wasn't. It was that like I saw them with someone else, and then my parents were like, let's go see it. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, okay. Yeah. Okay. So... Actual recommendations now. Two quick announcements first. Uh-oh. Why did you not do this at the top of the show? Because I forgot. Do I have to cut these in at the beginning of the show no, now? No, just put them in right now. If people want to hear our recommendations... <laughs> right now. We know right people now. People will listen to this point or they'll skip to the recommendations and they'll land right here. So I have to remember to put this in with the... Okay. Yes. So, so if you're listening work. to this the week that it's released, we're going to be at Rose City Comic Con in Portland, September Correct. 20th and 21st, yes. 2014. So if yes. you're in the Portland area, if you're going to the con, say hi to us on the floor because we're going to be looking for you. Yeah. We know what you look like somehow. Yes. In this theater. That, that is creepy. It's the cameras in the in No. The they had to click accept. Computer cameras. They're no. always on. So yeah, that's a thing that's happening. You should check it out. It looks like it's going to be an awesome show. Yeah. Uh, announcement Some number big two. big names there this year. Uh, long run, episode number eight, Stephanie Brown. Gonna be coming out in about two weeks. Yeah, roughly. Give or take. So yeah. we're gonna record it as soon as we get back from that con. It should come out like either that week or the week after. Right. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoilers in this. <laughs> um so yeah, if you're if you're reading along with us, God help you. I have to quack uh, uh, but that episode will be coming at you soon. Every episode, I have to quack out something Brant spoils. Really? Every episode. Really? You just want Everyone. an excuse to use Last sorry. episode, you were like, oh, and then Luke Skywalker's dad is... And it's like, that has to be bleeped out. No. I'm sorry. I have a strict 12-month policy. That's it? 12 months? Yeah. Ugh. This is the internet age. If you haven't established or heard, you, like, you either don't care enough, or... Or you're busy. Or you've heard. You have a life. No. Things aren't that uh, important to you. No. Recommendations? <laughs> yes. God help us, please. Sorry, I'm still on the spoiler alert. Spoilers in it. Brant, 
what are you, what would you like to read next week? I was juggling back and forth between two Vertigo and Volume 1 trades, and I have decided to land on 100 Bullets, number Ooh. one, by Brian Azzarello and Ooh. Eduardo Rizzo. It is probably my favorite, if not tied for, with three or four other titles, my favorite series of all time. And the first trade is compelling in of its own right. It's got an interesting flavor. It's not a superhero book. I love it, love it, love it. And it's about a mysterious suited figure giving 100 bullets and a gun to... Untraceable. Untraceable bullets to individuals promising that the person he's identified in the accompanying briefcase is solely responsible for the reason that that person's life is horrible and they can do whatever they'd like with the gun and the bullets and then basically walks away. Which just is kind of like, what would you do if somebody gave you a gun in a picture and said, this person ruined your life. What would you like to do about it? No one will ever come ask you any questions about any bullets they find from this gun. Well, of the hundred bullets that they gave you. I suppose conceivably you could put a hundred and first bullet in there and somebody might come ask a question about that one. This was also the premise of one of those horrible Saw movies. Yeah. I don't uh, know about that. Saw 12. We read a hundred bullets. <laughs> <laughs> it was a weird subtitle. Cool. Most people didn't catch the reference. Yeah. Anything else that you want to say about it, Brand? Um, I think the one thing that I'm kind of slightly concerned about was that something that seemed edgy at the time was that Brian Nezzarello did a lot of like. There's a lot of characters who use like. Um, like street, street talking for the yeah. different types of places they're from. And, like, I don't know what level of, like, actual research he did about that. And I'm worried that now, like, a decade and a half later, I'm going to go back and be like, why would you ever have, like, a Latino character ever say something like that? That's horribly racist. I don't know. For, for sure that. Okay. Cool. Cade, what do you got? Okay. So, the whole Batman month thing. Oh. Like, last week I recommended oh. Transformers because it was Den- Denny O'Neill. Oh. And well, who named now. Optimus Prime? Yes. This time I bought a book that actually has Batman in it. Sweet. Um, and this is Superman, Batman, Public Enemies by Jeff Loeb and Ed McGinnis. And um, this is the f- first volume in the series, correct? This is the first volume of the 2004-ish. And you you pitched the second volume, which is I have the pitched, reintroduction of Kara zor Yeah, I have pitched the Supergirl one many times, and there is another one on my shelf to be pitching as well, because I loved the series. I really did. Um, so yeah, so this is Public Enemies, and this is uh, President Lex Luthor, who builds the, the green and purple suit that I've always loved, because it has purple in it. And is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're traditional villain colors. Or Hulk colors. Yeah. Well, I thought you repeat yourself. bad guy. Um, he... bad guy. He's just misunderstood, Toby. He just he... has some issues that he's trying to work through, man. Why you got to hate on him like that? Cade, what, what are we doing? <laughs> Please turn off your vocal circuitry. <laughs> Oh, that was one of my favorite lines from the Transformers. I forgot to mention it. Um, He accuses Superman for crimes against humanity, and Superman and Batman go on the run uh, against, or versus Lex Luthor's crack team of quote unquote superheroes. Including. Trying to chase them down. Metallo, right? That's the This is the one with Metallo. Yes. Yeah. Um, And. one of the Green Lanterns, Power Girl. Um, I remember Deadshot was in the movie. I don't remember if he was in this book or not. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've read this. Okay, so it's Batman and Superman on the run from President Luthor's personal superhero squad. Yes. Of villains. Yeah. Not villains. Not villains. They're heroes. They're led by Captain Adam. Ah. And it's Power Girl and Green Lantern and like John Stewart, right? All the, well, the president says it, so we've got to at least bring him in for a fair trial. Yeah. Okay. You're only hurting yourself, Clark, by resisting the rule of law. I doubt that he would call him Clark. Yeah, I don't even, yeah. (laughs) I'm just saying. Although I I have a hard time ever reading anything with Captain Adam in the lead because I can only ever think about JLI and it's kind of like, (laughs) Captain Adam. I only think of the, uh, the JLU where he's voiced by one of the CSI guys. Oh, yeah. 
which I thought was a great voice for him. Yeah, it is. But uh, that interpretation of the character was really good. Yeah, I thought so too. And he's actually got a crew cut instead of like a weird perm. Well, yeah, they after the nineties they like got rid of some of his weird hair issues. But uh, is there anything else that you wanted to say about the book, Cade? Just that it's Jeff Loeb, Superman, Batman, and it's some of my favorite stuff ever. Um, I own a lot of it, and I think it's really good. Awesome. Yeah, I think the series continues to go. Like it went on to go cool places. Like it had sixty or seventy some odd issues, right? Yeah, it went yeah. for a long time. I cool. think there were like seventeen trades in all. Yeah, it was a lot of stuff. A lot of trades. There were some very cool one shot issues in there, or like two parters. That I don't know if they ever got collected or not. But yeah. Oh, and they the always had that the the dual color uh, yeah. boxes for Superman and Batman. Oh, the so narration could, boxes. Yeah, yeah. So you could see both of their thoughts. Yep. On each panel, and sometimes they say the complete opposite side. Or the complete opposite thing yeah. in the exact same situation. So I always loved that, the duality between the two characters. And their relationship is explored in a really cool way in this book, too. So. Bow chicka bow wow. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's no. a purely sexual relationship. That's what I meant. So, Adam, <clears throat> what do you uh, got? Apropos of our earlier discussion of Marvel shuffling adjectives around... I would like to take the opportunity <laughs> to uh, recommend Incredible Hercules Volume 1. Oh, oh nice. That one's so because good. Because I was digging through my boxes saying, oh, I, what should I recommend? What's a little bit further back? And, you know, I found this and that. And Incredible Hercules, uh, it didn't have a long-lasting impact on the continuity, but it really updated Hercules' character and has stuck with that and it made a lot of waves in the internet community those pages you know pages and panels from that series were getting posted around and are still getting posted around mm-hmm. it's greg packer wrote that. yes it was it was him staying on this is immediately following up on world war hulk yep and it's pack staying on the title it even keeps the numbering yep. yeah because this is them you know, the early experiments. So it starts with Incredible Hercules 131, I think. Yeah. And it's Hercules and Amadeus Cho picking up in the uh, Hulk wrecked New York and uh, making their way to New Jersey and both of them dealing with issues. Uh, I, the, even the covers would have Hercules, it would have like Incredible Hulk in the background and then like Hercules would be like holding up his own name in front of yeah, Hulk and like yeah. clever stuff like that a lot. And, Overall, I really like the series. The problem is it's interrupted by, repeatedly by crossovers, first oh, yeah. by the Skrull invasion and then by Dark Reign. So the and good volumes... And then by volumes, Siege, too, right? What? And then Siege, too, right? Oh, I think it was ended by then. Oh, okay. But, so, you know, the good the good volumes are sort of evenly interspersed with the okay volumes, but the first one is the... You know, it really caught my attention at the time, and uh, I think it holds up, it's fun, and it's very much a precursor to what Marvel has done with, as I said, with the adjective shuffling and with trying out lesser known or characters that have just been in the background for a while and giving them a shot and see what they can do. Yeah. Yeah. They were going to do this in like Journey, uh, Journey into Mystery when mm-hmm. they like replaced Kid Loki with Sif, but didn't change the name or the numbering. Mm-hmm. In the new Hawkeye well, series, a, yeah, Journey into Mystery featuring Seth. Right. Um, I also think that this is the best thing that happened uh, as a result of a World War Hulk, which I found incredibly disappointing after Planet Hulk. And then you you bring Hulk back from space to be like, and now. <laughs> Hulk smash everything. And then prison. I am. Because it's really exciting to watch a character sit in prison for a long time. So, like, immediately remove him from his own book. Yeah. I liked World War Hulk. It wasn't so much that I didn't like World War Hulk. It was that what happened afterwards was such a travesty. Well, yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, it was a signal of what has become... And I hope this doesn't seem too harsh to anybody. The slow spiraling unfortunateness that is now Jeff Loeb. Yeah. His kind of descent from greatness. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this was after 
Ultimates 3, so we had already had that low point. Yep. So. But yeah, Red Hulk was not a high point in his career, unfortunately. Yes. Now, the basic concept has stuck around to generally net positive effect, but the... It's, I've it's yet the, to read a Red Hulk story where it could not have just been Green Hulk. No, there's no, the there's, one where he goes on the oil platform. You know what I'm talking about? Where the, he, the like, is one with General Ross. Where he's running the team. The Thunderbolts. Yes. The th- that's is really good synergy since he's Thunderbolts. But guys. it's not a Thunderbolts book. That was my problem with it. Well, yeah. Yeah. It, I didn't... I, I'm i not saying... I'm not saying pointing it out to recommend it in any way i'm just pointing out it as saying that is uniquely thunderbolt ross red hulk that's true story but speaking of incredible hercules you know it picks up after world war hulk it really doesn't pick up much from hulk itself but except for amadeus cho and him having issues with shield over all that oh yeah. yeah which are a large part of the first volume and speaking of other references, uh, they pull out some references to the Marvel Godzilla comic, if you know what you're looking for in there. <laughs> the helicarry they pull out of Mothballs was the one that the anti-Godzilla team was tooling around on. Oh, nice. funny. Sweet. Anything well, else that you want to say about it? No, I, I think it's fun. Uh, it's not super high profile, but uh, it's got some interesting stuff in there. So, when we were talking about Transformers last week, I actually misspoke. I said it was the first comic that I ever owned. It wasn't, because Adam was getting them when I was really little, and I was just reading them. So, it was the first comic book that I read. The first comic book that I ever owned was one that my father gave to me for Christmas, which was Usagi Ojimbo Volume Mm. 3. And I fucking love Usagi Ojimbo like you would not believe. It's one of my absolute favorite comics. And I've been thinking about pitching it for a really long time. And I've held off because it's got such a long running and expansive story. I've hesitated to want to pitch any one particular volume. I was looking through my shelf today and I thought to myself, I think that there's actually a good starting point that we can read one volume that would work really well. Is it volume one? It's not. It's actually volume <laughs> eight. Volume one is pretty rough. Yeah. Very rough. I, I think that Usagi really gets started with volume three, which is a bunch of standalone stories, and then volume four, which is the first like arc mm. where there's like a big thing happening. And I wouldn't want to start with either three or four, and I didn't want to pitch two of them because the, the volumes are relatively thick. Uh, but between volume seven and eight, The book switches from being published by Fantagraphics to being published by Dark Horse. They did a new numbering, and they kind of did a little bit of a soft relaunch in terms of reintroducing you to the characters a little bit. So I'm going to be pitching Volume 8, Shades of Death, which has two main stories, one of which crosses over with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Swag. So the comic starts out with Usagi. He's a masterless samurai wandering feudal Japan. Uh, And his buddy, Gen, who is a rhino bounty hunter. All the characters in this series are anthropomorphic animals. Yep. Uh, And they're being chased by ninjas. Uh, And they get driven down into this, like, little isolated village where there's the, like, head man of the village is this rat guy. And he's like, oh, I summoned you here to protect us. And now I need to summon some more protectors. And he casts a magic spell and summons the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles into this universe. And this is actually like the third time that Leonardo specifically has met Usagi Ojimbo. None yeah. of the other turtles had before. And they have an adventure fighting the Neko Ninja clan. Sweet. And it's an awesome time. There's actually, a follow-up story where it's Usagi defending a different village against some other people and some other side stories and some young Usagi stuff. And it's a really good time. It's a great introduction to the character. And I think you can read and appreciate this volume without necessarily knowing everything that's come before it. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's crossing over with the Archie Adventures Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and not the Eastman and Laird. You know, I really am not sure about that. Okay. I'll look it up before the next one. I seem to remember that. I I never really read the different Turtles comics. Well, I've not I was a solely a Turtles cartoon watcher. Yeah. So I really couldn't tell you. All I remember yeah. is buying these issues originally – Looking at the covers, they all had red masks. Okay. 
That could have been one of two series then. It would not have been the uh, Archie no, Avengers. No, it definitely was. Presumably Archie. because it's being published by Dark Horse. It was Did the Turtles Dark Horse have Turtles. a Dark Horse Turtles? They had an Image Turtles run. Okay. That was after the Eastman and Laird one that was published by that really small company. The yeah. next big publisher was Image, I believe. Okay, so I'm It'll really not sure which in, Turtles it are. Uh, is but it really doesn't matter because yeah. they don't reference a whole lot from the turtles cat. Cool. As a kid I actually had a Usagi toy and that's because it was from one of the early Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles toy series. Yeah, yeah they, Usagi was actually he crossed over into the Turtles cartoon. Yep. Yeah. And that's where that toy came from. Correct. Well, he also became part of the like mythos of the uh Mutanimals with in the Turtles which were like <laughs> they were just mutant animals but they were up to there was like a manta ray and a gecko and yeah. wingnut and screw loose and is that where like rock guys. steady and no 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 okay. no, no. no but it's you a good old time it's funny to watch the turtles kind of interacting with this alternate universe there's one point where donatello is like asking them questions like why is a rhino a, a human and as a horse a horse and like he's just asking all of these random questions and they're like what the fuck are you talking about <laughs> It's like, why Why do you wear clothes? And they don't. And he's like, because uh, I have manners. <laughs> uh, that's great. If, oh, if you are enjoying Usagi, but you have not noticed that they did a relaunch recently, the new series of Uja- Usagi Ujimbo is coming out, Senzo. Which yes, and I read the first two issues of that. you have talked about on top of the stack. I have. It's very cool. So good. Uh, it's very cool indeed. Um, and also, there was this really cool fan-made claymation Usagi Ujimbo short film. That someone made online that was pretty rad. That it's not just a fan made short film. It is a fan made short film that they made to show to Stan Sakai to secure his permission to make a Usagi Ojimbo feature, which he gave. Cool. So that is a thing that is going to happen. Sweet. Okay. Anything else you have to say? No, I think that's it. All right, Sandra so Chart, what image book have you brought for us this week? Yeah, I didn't bring image this week. <sighs> no, I, I did. Oh, God. <laughs> I was worried. Yeah, I, I lied. Um, so I've been reading a ton of image books just in preparation of like, which ones of these am I actually, cause I have a huge list of like <laughs> which ones a hundred and something recommend? image books just cause I was like, here's all the books that I think are good or haven't read yet and want to check out. And so I'm just reading, I read like five different image books today just to like try out the first trades of a bunch of these and uh, to see if they're worth recommending at some point or another. And the one that really stuck with me today uh, was a series that is getting a lot of press right now, uh, mostly because one of the names attached to it uh, is Robert Kirkman. The thing about this, which is really interesting, is Robert Kirkman does the plots, but does not write the issues themselves. And each of the trades, although one continuous story arc, trade one, two, three, uh, they're each written by a different person. So I've spaced on the name in the first one because uh, I don't have it sitting in front of me. But uh, the second name, the second trade is written by James Asmus. And the third one is, uh, I believe, Andy Diggle. Yeah, Andy Diggle, uh, who wrote a great Hellblazer run that I love. Um, basically, uh, the series is called Thief of Thieves. And uh, it's a crime book. Um about thieves and uh it almost sounds like a parker story yeah kind of basically the yeah i'm sure it's inspired by that as many crime stories are nick um, spencer nick spencer the thank first, you uh, wrote the uh, first um trade uh nick spencer who i really like um but the first trade is called uh i quit um, and he basically goes to his cartel. They've planned the big Venice job, which you don't really find out what it is until the third trade. But uh, he he gets to the meeting, the Ocean's Eleven meeting, where they're going to like lay out the whole plan. There's like the grifter and the distraction and all this stuff, and it like goes through the whole heist movie thing, and he gets to the final meeting right before the job, and he's like, I'm done. I'm done being a thief. I quit. I'm out. And it starts kind of at the end of his career and it works backwards in the storytelling to tell parts of like, you know, this guy has a son. This guy got started a long time ago before his son was born. What was it like growing up as like a professional thief when he had a son? Like his, he's estranged from his wife. Like how did that work out with his marriage? And it's kind of told in this like flipping back and forth uh, thing. And the cool thing is because Kirkman's plotted it all, it feels like one consistent story. But uh, having each writer write a different trade 
helps vary the content a little bit. So I'm recommending, I believe it's the first 17 issues, uh, 19, the first 19 issues, which are the first three trades, which is all that's come out in the trade of Thief of Thieves. And does that end on an okay place to end a story? Uh, not really. I mean, it's it's an ongoing series, so it is going to be what it is. But each trade is a complete job, basically. So okay. you get three jobs, but there is an overarching story on that. And there's like, you know, he's working for the drug cartel to help his son out of a difficult situation. He's trying to get away from the FBI. There's all this cool interplay that's going on and the cool cast of characters that he's kind of assembled as his, like, pro-thief team. Um, and the kind of cool ways he does his little, like, usual suspect switcheroos all the time uh, and the Ocean's Eleven little tricks uh, are really awesome. I think it's a really fun series if you like any of those series, the Parker stuff, Ocean's Eleven. There really should be a professional thieving league. Well... Read this book. Okay. And they're kind of, I mean, there's, it's, it's like a network. It's less of a league. Well, I, I, I mean, like a, <laughs> like a pro sports thing. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Like an e, like a sport where you can like, you, you as a fan, like you're watching. Like warrior like, for heist jobs. Yeah. There's like a, there's like a, a, a security team versus a thief team. And they like. Or just like a bunch of thief teams. Like who can get the biggest score within this time period? Regulation mm. play, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> So, Brant, what would you like to vote for? I fondly remember Incredible Hercules, and I would like to investigate that once more. Wait. Gade? This is a really tough choice. I want to vote for all four of them. But I think I really want to read Thief of Thieves. Wait. I got to go with Usagi. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, I've been reading it as long as my brother, and so uh, good. Usagi is good stuff. So good. Uh, I'm also going to vote for The Incredible Hercules. Sweet. Uh, so I can't vote for what I was going to vote for, which was, right? Because I'm the last vote? Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. which was Usagi, because I... Uh, oh, because you don't want to create a tie. I can't create a tie. I think we should... I know, your complicated system of everyone it's gets a new... It's not complicated. It's like... A, your it's, vote has no. been eliminated, everyone gets a new it's vote. It's called double removal or whatever. It's... it's, I was, it's all, you don't even know the name of it. That's I, how complicated I can't, Because it is. I'm tired, but like, <laughs> basically... A lot of democratic societies use it. I mean, it's essentially an instant runoff vote. Yeah. Well, it yeah. basically That's means exactly. you vote for Usagi and then we make Cade pick between the two. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm fine with doing that. Yeah, I'm I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> it <laughs> violates some sort of gonna, ethic, ethics. We're going to stick with what we got. Maybe we will open a conversation on this at another time. <laughs> No, no, I think we should do it right here at the end of episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to vote for Superman, Batman, then in honor of Batman Month. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. so for next time, The Incredible Hercules, Volume 1 by Greg Pak and yeah. an artist who I don't know who that is. Now, was, so was that the whole run of Incredible Hercules? Oh, no, no, no. It's just like four or five issues. Okay. Yeah, the whole it's run a short. total is like 20-something, 30-something issues. Right? Yeah, which maybe is, 30. I think there might have been like five volumes. Which is actually okay. great because we're going to be at Rose City all weekend and right. not have and, as much time to read. And then we have okay. to read 160 issues of Stephanie oh, Brown. I'm finished. I'm oh, done I mean, with that. I read it months Never ago. again. <laughs> Never again. Uh, to create the list, I read many more issues of Robin and, and other Batman books. Um, but yeah, okay. Uh, we'll do that. Look for us at Rose City, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. And next week we are reading Incredible Hercules Volume 1. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to me from the gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes read. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.